Thank you, Stanley. <laughs> All right, uh, as you just said, my name is JK. Although the talk is called Intro Memory Corruption and ROP, alternative title is, okay, maybe it's actually intermediate corruption and ROP, but you got this. So can I have a show of hands? Who here has never done an overflow? Like written overflow and like done the whole thing end to end, even an easy one? Okay, that's not too bad. Um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to, I'm going to show you kind of like a fake CTF problem. So the, the concept here is that you decide to play CTF uh, at layer one of some other conference, and you open up the binx category, binary exploitation or pwn, and you saw the 200 point problem or the 100 point problem, and you said, I don't know what to do. So we're going to start there, and then we're going to kind of skip a little bit in the middle and get to like the fun, kind of more intermediate advanced stuff. So if you get totally lost, that's cool. I encourage you to not get frustrated and try and pick up bits along the way. You'll, as you'll see, it's more about problem solving than it is about like memorizing all these commands. Like there's giant long YouTube videos that'll teach you how to do this from beginning to end. Those are probably a better source if you want that like in-depth kind of learning. This is like, what does this look like when somebody does it for real at kind of full speed, okay? But I'm gonna do my best to explain as I go and then afterwards you can meet me out. I'll be hanging out in front of the CTF room if you want to come hang out over there and talk to me and, you know, I'll do my best to help clear this stuff up. All right, we need to go fast though. So, here's the scenario. Oh, and on the screen, if, uh, if you've been doing this for a while, that's what we're gonna go through. So if you decide, like, this isn't for me, I already know all that stuff, um, then feel free to leave. Don't come out if your one's done. All right, so, in this scenario, you have opened up a CTF problem. This is what it says. Name of the problem is Easy Web. It's 300 points. The category is binary exploitation. And the description says wanted, full stack web developer. Um, as you'll find out, this is not a web hacking problem. Uh, included in that uh, for download, so on like the website for the uh, CTF, say, there's two files, Easy Web and libc.so.6. So Easy Web is going to be a binary. So that's what you run, right? Like dot slash Easy Web. It's an executable. It's like a Windows EXE. On Linux, it's an ELF. And then libc is like a helper library, right? It's on every Linux system, but they have given you one. So that's kind of your hint, like I might have to go do things with that specific libc at some point, right? That's what that's telling you from like a kind of a gaming perspective. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assume this is binary exploitation because of the category, and I'm just gonna run it. Um, you should be in a VM when you do this stuff, so like if you're scared to run stuff, then like don't run malware. Uh, all right, it says socket created successfully, listening for connections. So immediately, I'm going to pop a new tab and do netstat tac plant, or whatever your favorite netstat is. I see two ports listening, 53 and 631. So I'm going to run EasyWeb, and I'm going to check that again. And look, a new one, port 8080, uh, and it's running EasyWeb. So what this means is that you ran it, and it opened up a listener on port 8080. So there's now a server listening for connections on port 8080, right? So the first thing I'm going to do, it said web, full stack, whatever, right? Like there's obviously references to like internet, HTTP. So I'm going to pop a browser and I'm just going to try and go there and see what happens. All right, so I know the uh, font's not great, but I went to 127.001 colon 8080, right? And it says not found. Uh, you can see that this, well, you probably can't see because I can't zoom it. There we go. Uh, this is HTML, right? So this is a functional web server, so kind of you're validating your assumptions that you got from the hints. And now you're ready to start looking for, uh, for vulns. So what is the goal here? In the context of a CTF, the goal is typically to get a shell on the server that is running this. So they'll usually give you an IP address to connect to once you've got the exploit fully developed, and then you throw, and your goal is to usually get a shell or read a flag file out of the same directory the web server is running in. That's kind of what normal looks like. So that's going to be our goal here. So the first thing we're going to do kind of triage-wise, uh, we're just going to strings the binary. It's super simple. Like, you should always do it just in case something pops out at you. So as you do this stuff, you see all these dots, like dot finny, dot text, dot init, dot whatever. These are section names in a binary. These are in like every Linux elf. So you can ignore this stuff. This isn't what you're looking for. Same thing if you see glibc, like numbers and versions and stuff. You can ignore all this. You see underscores, you can ignore it. This is stuff that's in like every binary that isn't, the, that isn't like the uniqueness that you're looking for. 
Uh, you scroll up here, there you start seeing text. It's like web server relevant, right? So we see web server is occupied successfully. And then I see something here. I see slash hello. So if you see slash in like a word, then usually that's the end of a URL, right? So google.com slash about, right? Uh, in this case, this gives me a hint that I might be able to type slash hello and get to something more interesting um, on this web server. So I'm going to try it. And uh, big surprise, it says hello. Not very exciting, right? You check source to be sure. There's nothing interesting in there. But like I say, uh, you, you still check because uh, you never know. It might be some box you type passwords in or the flag might just be there. Um, you always check. So now we've determined that this is a web server. So now we're going to actually start uh, trying to pop the thing. So next thing you're going to do is do check sec. Check sec uh, looks at the binary. It looks at all the uh, permissions on, on section segments to see if it's uh, what parts are executable, what parts are writable. Uh, it looks for something called position independent executable, which means that the program portion of the loaded, of the loaded image is going to move around randomly. Um, these, are kind of, these are mitigations we're going to have to deal with. I'll, I'll go into these more in a bit. But you always want to check this to see like where you stand, right? So the big one here is stack canaries. So we're going to be doing a buffer overflow for this example, but it's just a starting point. Um, we're going to get more complicated as we go. But stack canaries, they can ruin a buffer overflow very, very quickly. And unless you've got some, something else going on complexity-wise, there's not like a universal bypass for canaries. So we care if there's canaries in our target binary. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the rest of these uh, kind of as we go. So the first thing I want to do, instead of hitting this thing in a browser, with like Firefox or whatever, I want to hit it from a script so I can start malforming the inputs that I'm feeding it, right? Because we're going to send this thing corrupted inputs with the eventual goal of getting a shell. So we're going to start that process now. So I'm going to just make a new file called exploit.py. Um, I use very bare bones stuff. My, my VimRC is like default. My GDB init is default. Um, one thing I do use though is Pwn tools. Um, oh, and uh, we have uh, my friend Steven here is going to be taking notes. Um, so as I say things like Pwn tools, you don't have to like write that down. As you see commands, you don't have to write those down. He's got you, and then we're going to paste them in the Discord and the CTF channel. So you don't have to sit there and like lose your train of thought trying to write down all the stuff. Like what was that command? Um, He's going to hook you up. And then I'll post all this code and everything in the Discord in the CTF channel so you guys can like try it on your own afterwards. All right, so Pwn Tools, uh, it's just a Python like library. And it gives you a bunch of convenience functions. Uh, the ones that manage like connections and GDB and like starting processes are super, super handy. It lets you like not have to do raw sockets and stuff um, to, to work on problems like this. So, is it from Pwn import star or is it the other way around? Let me know. We'll find out in a second. All right, so proc and process uh, EasyWeb. Process comes from Pwn tools. This will start the uh, EasyWeb process just like I typed it into the shell. Uh, the difference, though, is that you can programmatically, in, in, programmatically interact with this thing. So you can say things like uh, proc.read or dot receive, excuse me. Um, yeah. And it says socket already in use. That makes sense because we're still running over here. Cool. So you can see the output of the program sitting there on the terminal. All right. So once we start it, we're going we're gonna to make a connection to it. So now it's, so once it's started, it's listening. We're going to uh, use remote and go to 127.0.0.1, port 8080. And then we're going to say remote.send. Um, so we know it's a web server, right? Because Firefox is able to talk to it. 
So if you didn't know HTTP, you can go go on Wikipedia and just get like what's the most bare bones HTTP command I can send this thing, and that's going to be our starting point. So if you do git slash HTTP slash 1.1, and then do rn rn, that'll usually get most web servers to talk to you. Some of them want a host header too, uh, but this usually works. So we're going to send that, and then we're going to receive back and see if we can get to the point where it's acting like the web server. And then we're going to start corrupting inputs to try and overflow and uh, go forth and grab shells. Let's see. Okay, so it's sent back HTTP 200 OK server content. It says not found. Remember that uh, message we got? So that means that this is working. And we are able to now send things to the web server. So all this stuff is pwn tools. Um, if you do this kind of raw, then you're making like sockets and doing things manually, and it really, really sucks. So I recommend doing it this way. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we know it's memory corruption. We know it's a 300 point problem. Uh, the only way you can really send to a normal web server like this is by sending these git slashes or post requests. This is kind of like your interface. This is your way to get malicious input to the target. So if there is an overflow, we don't know that there is, but if there was an overflow, it'd probably be somewhere in this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw some A's in here and see if I can get it to crash, and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So this is what makes Python nice. You just do like A times 2,000 and then add scale with the other strings and it just kind of figures it out. So we're going to see, cool, so it got a seg fault, right? So seg fault usually indicates that it's that the processor is either trying to read from a memory address that's not mapped in or a memory address that's not readable or it's trying to write to, a, to an address that's not writable or it's trying to execute from an address that's not executable or the memory's not mapped in at all. So we're doing something with memory typically that involves breaking permissions or touching pages that aren't mapped. So this is hard to figure out what's going on because it's just an, it's just an error with a, with, a, with a stack trace, right? This is not useful for you figuring out kind of what to do next. So we need to go into GDB. Oh, an alternate name for this talk is uh, GDB Improv Hour, <laughs> since that's what's going to be happening. So instead of starting it with process, right, so process easy web, you can just hot swap out for gdb.debug. This is the power of pwn tools. You can just swap little bits out and everything else still works. So we're going to try that out and see if we can figure out what caused this thing to crash. So it automatically pops up this box. This, uh, the, the terminal that's up top, that's up front here that got popped up, that's the GDB, and then your script is still in the background here. So something stops, says could not connect on port, blah, blah, blah. What's happened here is that GDB, when it starts up, it automatically sets a breakpoint whenever the process first starts. So the server's beginning to start, and then it pauses and waits for you to type here. And meanwhile, your script is trying to connect to it with that remote. And the result is that it times out, because you're sitting here not running, right? So to get around this, we need to make this thing automatically type the word continue. So I type Conti, uh, continue is the full name of this GB command, and that will let it keep going. But now the process is dead. So, so how do we do this, right? I can't type fast enough to like get between my program trying to connect to the server. Well, it turns out there's an argument to gdb.debug where you can give it a list of GDB commands. It's called GDB script equals, and then you just give it strings and it will run those commands. So I'm going to say command equal uh, Conti, and we'll see if that uh, makes it go. Okay, so it went, and we got our seg fault. So uh, immediately we get some information, right? It gives us an address of where, where, where everything went wrong, where it broke, and it says process client's name of the function. So this tells us that we have symbols, which is great. It means that you don't have to go traipsing around guessing what functions are called. Although you can still do this without, without it, it's really nice to like get a head start if like things are labeled in a way that makes sense. So the first thing I'm going to do when I get a, when I get a, uh, a seg fault um, that I suspect is an overflow, I'm going to say what instructions 
am I trying to execute that are failing? So x slash 4i, dollar sign RIP, this is a 64-bit x86. If you didn't know that, you could type file followed by EasyWeb and it'll tell you. Um, you might see me type dollar sign PC as well. I do a lot of like MIPS and ARM and stuff, so that's like a habit. So x slash 4i means examine the next four instructions starting at RIP, which is the instruction pointer. This is like the next instruction that's going to execute on the processor. Um, oh, we're going to do, we're going to automate this in a second, but so if you've been doing this a while, you can read both flavors of assembly, but a lot of people find Intel easier to read, especially at first. So you can do set disassembly flavor Intel, and it looks a little nicer. It's got this like the word byte and pointer and stuff. It doesn't have all these percent signs everywhere. So this is the instruction that broke. It's inside the function called process client, and the instruction that broke is this move byte pointer rex0. So what this means, if you see these little square brackets, it means that you are trying to go inside of memory. So it's, what it's doing is it's trying to put the value 0 into memory at the address inside rex. Rex is like a little scratch pad. It's called a register. So some code before this probably set Rex to some memory location, and then we're trying to stick a zero in that spot. So Almost like a it is a pointer. Yeah, you're using Rex as a pointer, right? And then you're like right dereferencing it. Um, so I want to know what Rex is, right? So I'm going to do p slash x. That means print as hexadecimal p slash x, and then dollar sign Rex. Like, where is this thing trying to write a zero that's failing? And then you see, okay, REX is set to 41, 41, 41, 41, 40. Um, for those that don't know, uh, hex 41 is how you represent a capital A in ASCII. So, and 42 is B, right, and so on. So, you'll start to recognize these. So, what that means is that my A's have corrupted REX, and I'm trying to write a value into, like, the place pointed to by REX. So, I'm going to open up this binary in Ghidra. Um, so there's kind of two tools you can use. Because we, we just saw a couple instructions, right? That just moved into REX. I want to see the rest of it. I want to see what all the functions look like. And I also want to see it in like decompiled C. Because assembly kind of hard to read and figure out what's going on. There are tools that will give you like really bad C code back. And you can kind of get some context to figure out what's going on. The two that are the most popular are Ida Pro. Uh, and there's also a free version of that as well, and then uh, and then Ghidra. The free version of Ida Pro does not come with a decompiler, correct? In 2023, still no decompiler in Ida Free? Just checking. Uh, Ghidra does, uh, but it was written by the NSA, so if that spooks you out, then I guess be careful. Um, but yeah, Ghidra's free, and it comes with a decompiler, which is really nice. So that's what I use. So we'll open up in Ghidra real quick. This is mostly just so you guys can see Ghidra. Um, and see that you can, in fact, see C code. So uh, the, um, the font will be a little bit bigger in a second. I want to make sure I'm getting the right one here. Easy web, easy web. I'm just following the prompts and hitting like the OK button. You're not missing nothing. Ah, that is not big enough, right? Let's go. <laughs> Tool options, there it is. Listing display, there we go. All right, hopefully it's big enough. So uh, we got a crash earlier. We're going to have to run it again to get the uh, location. So x slash 4i RIP. So we're at that move rex thing. So what I'm going to do is grab this address over here on the left side. 
and slap into Ghidra and just see what's there. So I can get some more context than just like four instructions around it. Cool. We're not going to spend much time looking at the, uh, the decompilation. We're going to get to like the exploity part of this and kind of pass the bug finding bit really quickly uh, because we don't have a whole lot of time. But it highlights the instruction. Uh, this is that move rex thing right here. You rec probably recognize that. Um, and then the corresponding C that did that is on the right. Um, so it's trying to stick a null byte, probably for the end of a string, into the end of a, uh, a character buffer. So, and then we see some more context on here for the rest of the web server. So I just wanted to show you what that looked like, that you can, that if you didn't know what all the assembly meant, you can in fact go in here and like read C and get a better understanding of the bug. But now we're gonna skip past like how we deal with this, right? The problem is that we need to get past this so we can get down to overwrite the return pointer so we can eventually hijack execution. So there's actually a few of these that happen in here. Here's one, um, this local 30 equals zero, local 20 equals zero, local 28 equals zero. Um, I did all these earlier. Uh, I leave this as an exercise to the reader for now because we don't have time to, to go through it. So I'm just gonna skip ahead to the point where the A's are landing on the return pointer. And we're gonna go from there. So we'll be skip skipping to exploit2.py. So the code should look really familiar. We're set to assembly flavor intel up here, and then continue. Uh, we're doing debug. And then in here is the bit that we're skipping. Um, basically, you have to stick a writable address in that spot. So when it goes to put the zero in there, it's writable. So I went and found just a writable address in the binary somewhere and I'm making sure that that address lands in the right spot in those A's, so those 41's get replaced by a writable address. So that way that move rex succeeds. And then right down here where these B's are, so buff plus equal B times 1,000, that is, should land uh, on our return pointer or close to it. So let's make sure it works and then we'll continue on. Okay, we got a seg fault. Let's do our little, do our little ritual here. So x slash 4i RIP. Okay, this time we are not on a move rex zero whatever, we're on a ret. So this is what you want. You wanna have your seg fault happen on this return instruction. And the, you'll see the reason for that very shortly, but ret sends the instruction pointer to wherever the stack tells it to go. And you'll see very shortly that we control the contents of the stack. So I'm doing uh, x slash 4 gx RSP. Uh, the g means it's 64 bit, and we're printing it as hexadecimal. So this means go to the stack RSP and examine the next, the next kind of like, what's an eight? The next eight bytes at a time and do four of those and show me what's on the top of the stack. So, so it shows us four of them and there's eight bytes in each one. And at the top of the stack is right here. The next kind of slot on the stack is to the right. And then the third is down here, and then the fourth is to the right on the bottom, right? So the top of the stack's right here. So it means that when this ret executes, so if I step one instruction, it means it's gonna try to send the instruction pointer to the address 42, 42, 42, 42, uh, which obviously is not map memory, and that's why it's seg faulting, right? But what's fun about this is that we control it. Like we control the 42, those are B's, right? So one thing I wanna do is figure out exactly what part of the B's this is so I can replace it with a real address and send execution where I want it to go. So I'm gonna check uh, RSP minus 16. So I'm gonna look up by kind of two slots. I see 42's there. I'm gonna look up. So RSP minus 32, I'm gonna look up by four slots. Okay, and I see stuff up there. So what this means is that if I take up two more slots before my Bs start, then I should be lined up where I can control that address exactly. So let's see what that looks like. You can also kind of trial and error this um, until it looks right. 
Uh, Pwn Tools does have like, like nifty tricks where you can make it like generate a sequence of characters and then you type what you see and it like figures it out for you. Um, I don't like that. I like to do it kind of manually. So, oh, here we go. So struct.pack. Um, struct is a Python library that like lets you pack bytes together and do fun stuff. Um, struct.pack, uh, this like less than Q means pack this as a 64-bit address in little endian or 64-bit number in little endian. So I should get eight bytes of zeros added to my buffer with this like struct.pack Q zero. So I said I need to take up two of them, right? Two slots before I let B start. So I'm gonna do exactly that. And then I think what I'm gonna do is add just one more of Bs. And we're gonna see if that kind of proves that we have full control over this. And if I'm off by one and you guys didn't say anything, I'm gonna be a little hurt. All right, so what do we always do? We do x slash 4i RIP. I do it every time. If you trust, say again. Yeah, you can. Uh, remember the GDB command? So we'll do that in a second. That's, really good. that's, a, that's a good point. And then I'm going to check the top of the stack, right? x slash 4gx RSP. Boom. So we have 43s, right? And then it kind of devolves into chaos after that. So now I can directly control where this thing is going to return to. So this is where the, uh, the fun starts. All right, we're at 1525, and now we get to the good part. So doing pretty good. All right, so these are those 43s right there. So all we have to do is replace those with where we actually want to go. So, but now we have to strategize for a second. We have full control of the stack at the point that we hit a return instruction. So what are we going to do? Our goal is to, in this case, we're going to print out a file called flag. Uh, I'll show you where that is real quick. So ls. There's this file in the same directory as EasyWeb called flag. Pretend, you're kind of pretending this all on the remote server while you're developing, and then when you throw it, you'll get the remote flag on the server, right? Uh, but for now, you just make a file called flag and then kind of try and get to it on your own, right? So you develop everything locally with kind of full visibility with the debugger, and you can poke stuff and write all your scripts and cheat, right? Um, and then when you're ready, you throw it against the real one and get the real flag, right? So. The first thing to note, remember that check sec thing I did earlier? Do it one more time. This is going to kind of inform what our options are. So in 2023, you need to assume that something called ASLR is on all the time. You also typically assume that NX is on, uh, or, or NX or the binary is built with NX. NX means non-executable stack. So when you go look up like 90s buffer overflows and you see like they're putting shell code in and then jumping to it. Yeah, that's pretty much dead. Um, maybe there's some O'Day out there somewhere where someone's still putting shell code on the stack and like doing M protect or something, but a lot of it's moved to like ROP only. Um, what ROP is is you're not writing your own code and like getting execution to go to it. You're using existing code in the program and the and the other libraries to do what you're trying to do, right? You kind of Lego it together with a series of return instructions. So we're on a return right now, and we can control where to go. We're going to do that, do something useful, and then return again. And we're going to kind of chain those together. That's because these, are, these elements you chain together are called ROP gadgets. Um, and you're, kinda, you're forming a, a ROP chain to do the thing you're trying to do. In this case, our goal is to print the flag out, right? Nothing else matters. Um, so to do that, we need to we need to somehow execute commands would be a good way to do that. Um, if we can execute arbitrary shell commands, then we can make a netcat session back to ourselves and like send the flag back. There's other ways to do it too. There's like no wrong answer to this, but, but we're going to try to go for the path of getting arbitrary execution where we can run a bash command. And then you could use that to get like shells and stuff too and if you wanted to go further. So in order to do that, we need to, we need to eventually jump to a function called system. So system is provided by libc. You can do man to system or not. If someone knows why I can't type man to system, let me know. Oh, I guess it's man. Yeah, man three system. Never mind. I don't use man pages. Um, oh, thank you. System calls as opposed to library functions. Perfect. Um, 
Okay, so man3 system, uh, it takes one command, it's a string, and then it's the command, right? And it's provided by libc. So if we can somehow turn this ret so we control where we're going to return to, if we can turn that into a function called a system with a command that we control, then we can make the, the remote system do whatever the hell we want, right? Up to and including catting the flag out. So that's what we're going to go for. But here's a problem. Because ASLR is on, ASLR is address space layout randomization, every time you run this server, the location of libc and a few other things moves around. So even though we have the libc, we have that file libc.so.6 we saw, and the, the system is a function in there, it's like code, it has an address, the whole thing is going to move around randomly every time we run the server. So we don't know where libc is. So therefore, we can't just stick the address of system in there and go return to it. So we have to solve a problem first. We have to figure out where libc is so that we can get around that and eventually go there. The other problem that we haven't solved yet is I want to run a custom command. Well, where am I going to put that and how am I going to get it so that it's an argument to this that called a system, right? Um, those are the kind of two problems we're going to solve. We're going to solve the libc one first. So you need to get information back from the remote server given, ex given control of execution. So does anybody know any libc functions that can send information to me? Like pretend you're the server, what libc functions can like give me information as a client? Send. Send's a good one. Write. If you can write to like the socket, right? Uh, printf doesn't help because printf prints to the console on the server. You don't get to look at that as the remote attacker, right? So send and write are what you're looking for. So what we're going to do is use our control of the return pointer to build a call to the write function that sends back a libc address. So this is, you're basically making a leak where there isn't a leak. So you're kind of, you're abusing an overflow to create a point, to create a leak. And then you're going to do the overflow again now that you know where all your gadgets, where, where libc is. So what you should be asking is, wait a minute, this, if write's a libc function and you said we don't know where libc is, how are we going to do this? Well, there's a, uh, there's a trick. We're going to pull up Ghidra again. So in order for code to work, uh, like this printf, right, where it's print, doing printf method equals something, when this actually executes, this is not call printf in libc. Printf is a function in libc, but this is not the call that goes there. There's something else happening. Instead of going to real printf in libc, now I gotta go figure out how Ghidra represents this. Might have to go find it in here. Where's plt? There it is. It's cutting off all of the, uh, <laughs> the uh, font's so big that it's, that it's cutting off what each of these is. All right, I'll just explain it. So instead of going to a libc address that we don't know that is the address of the write function, we're going to go to this place in your program, like in, in memory, your program, like your code, right, the printfs and stuff of the target. That doesn't move around unless that, remember it said pi in the uh, check sec? Yeah, this is no pi. If pi is turned on, then your entire application image also moves. So like the printfs that you just saw. But because pi, the, the program wasn't built with pi, it stays in one place. So it means that we do have some things we know where they are. Not everything randomizes. So one of the things that doesn't randomize is this bit of the program called the procedure linkage table, the PLT. What the PLT is, is like it's a little trampoline for every function in libc that gets called in the program. So we saw printf in Ghidra a minute ago. Let's go back. There it is. So this printf, it's hard to show it because the, font, the font's cutting it off, but this actually goes to a little stub, it's like a couple lines of code, in this thing called the procedure linkage table. 
From there, that sends it to libc, to the actual printf function. So similarly, if this program calls, uh, calls write somewhere, there will be an entry in that procedure linkage table that you can trampoline off, and more importantly, doesn't move under randomization. So what this all reduces down to is if your target program uses a libc function that you want to use, then, you, then you, know where, you know where its trampoline is in the PLT. So does this program use system? That's a piece of information I'm interested in knowing, right? Because then you can just jump to the system entry for PLT and you can get it to run arbitrary commands. So the way you can tell that, uh, in Gidra anyway, is under imports, if I can find it. Imports external and I know this is impossible to read. I, look, I tried for like half an hour to get this to get bigger, but I'll list them off. This is all the functions that are called from the target binary. It's not that many. Accept, accepts a connection, right? Bind, bind support, close, listen, printf, puts, read, socket, write. There's a few other ones that don't matter, but read, write are the ones that we care about for the, for the purposes of this thing. So what this means is that there is a spot that we can jump to that will, that will run right for us if we can just get there. So let's, uh, let's get a little, a little plan going here. So I know that I want to return to the right function. So I want to return to somewhere called PLT write. I'll get the address if this ends up staying the plan. So if I just return to this like little trampoline that goes to the write function, write takes three arguments. So let's look at what those are and what order they're coming. That is not. So here's the three arguments in order. There is the, the uh, file descriptor of where you want to write to. There's the buffer of what do you want to write to it, so like a string of characters, and then how many characters do you want to write. So our goal is to leak out a libc address. So addresses are eight bytes long and 64-bit, right? So the third argument's gonna be an eight. The file descriptor, so like where's the client? So in Linux, standard in, standard out, and standard error is like zero, one, two. We know that this thing opens up a socket to listen to get the connections come in, the web server. So that's going to be file descriptor four. And then when you connect to it, it does the accept, and that spins off file descriptor five. So you can, or no, three and four, right? So zero, one, two, and then three is the listener, and then four uh, is your socket. So if you write to socket file descriptor four, you are writing back to the guy that just connected to you, i.e. the attacker, right? So we know that the first argument we want it to be four. The only thing missing is the buffer. So what are we going to send back? How do we, we need to find an address that we know that has a libc address in it. So that way we can send it back to ourselves. So we need to find one of those. And one place that has this is called the global offset table. So the PLT, those little trampolines for every function that it's called, they pull the actual address of where those functions are in libc from this other spot called the global offset table. So it means that the address of write in libc is stored in the global offset table. The address of print in libc is stored in the global offset table. There's one for every, every function called, and we know where they are. So these addresses exist in memory in a spot that you can find. So what we're going to do is we're going to use write to leak the address of write. So we need to uh, figure out where it is in the global offset table first, though. And there we go. So in Ghidra, this says external, like, puts. And here's right, uh, right here. And am I going to be able to get that? I might have to make the uh, font slightly smaller so I can get that. Still too 
see dig. Uh, actually, I can grab it right there. All right, so let's kind of write out what this is going to look like. So we're going to call write with the number four, because we're writing back out to the socket. And we're going to do the got entry for write. And we're going to write out eight bytes, because the addresses are eight bytes long. So we need to build this call uh, in ROP somehow. So if we just return to the PLT entry for write just straight up, um, it's going to have whatever was in whatever's in the registers that are that are used for arguments when we start. We need to we need to build up this four, this got right, and this eight. So the way you do that is with these gadgets called pop rats. So in 64-bit, the first argument to a function, so arg zero, right? We want it to be a four. That is stored in the register called RDI. The second argument, we want that to be the address of uh, the write entry and the got. That's going to be an RSI. If you, uh, if you don't want to memorize this, then you can look up x86-64 calling convention. And that's where this stuff lives. Or you can look at code just in, the, in programs, and you'll see it filling up these registers in this order. Um, and then arg2 is, is rdx. So it means we've got to put a 4 in RDI the address of write in the global offset table in RSI, and then eight in RDX. And, that's, and then, we, then we return to the write, and that will cause it to write out the address of the write function in libc back to the attacker. So we need to populate RDI, RSI, and RDX. So the way you do that with ROP is with these things called, called pop rat gadgets. And the way you find them is with a piece of software called Ropper. Let's see, I think you gotta do, uh, now you gotta do it as a Python module, I think. So Ropper, tech tech file, I think, let's see. Yeah, ooh, that's really bad. Luckily, I'm gonna go to no color anyway. All right, so what this does is it goes through the EasyWeb binary and it finds every sequence of instructions that ends in a ret, so a return. The reason we want these gadgets to end in a return is because that's how we get our control, right? The only reason I'm able to control where execution goes right now is because I'm sitting on a return address and I control the stack. So I want to keep that going while I do things. So in this case, I want to I want to fill in RDI with the number four, right? I want to fill in that file descriptor. And then I'm going to fill in RSI, then I'm going to fill in RDX, and we're going to kind of go from there. So. I need a way to put a value into RDI that I control, in this case a four. So I'm going to pipe this and I'm going to grep for RDI. Show me all the gadgets that touch RDI. And there aren't that many. Uh, there's a weird one with like brackets and stuff that looks kind of scary. It's got a jump at the end instead of a ret. Like I don't want to deal with that. But look at this. There's one called pop RDI ret. So recall. Pop RDI means take whatever's at the top of the stack, which we control, stick it in RDI, and then kind of move one slot down and then return, i.e. go to the next thing in the stack. So this is a, this is a pop ret gadget. This is exactly what we want. So I'm going to copy that address out, and I'm going to use it as the starting point for my attack. But first, I want to make sure I have the rest of the things that I need to kind of follow through my plan. If I just start putting gadgets in and stuff, I hit a roadblock, that would have been a lot of wasted time, and we don't want to waste time. So we need to fill in RDI and RSI and RDX, right? Those are the first three arguments to any function call. So I'm going to grep for RSI. Cool, I have a pop RSI, pop R15, ret gadget. Perfect. Now I need one for RDX. Uh-oh. So notice, there's no cool pop RDX gadget in this binary. But I need that. I need to be able to control the third argument so I can put an 8 in there, so I can leak out 8 bytes of address, so I can continue the attack. But there's no good gadget for this. Or is there? So there's an alternative to this like gadget hunting thing. Um, 
there's a technique called ret to csu and what it is in every binary built with uh, glibc until very very recently um, as in ubuntu 2204 recently um, there is a section of this binary that has exactly what we need to make four argument function calls. So it has a way to control RDX, which is kind of what we're missing right now. Um, so the function is called CSU init. So libc CSU init. I'm not going to go over what this is for, but basically the C compiler sticks this in every single binary, or used to until very recently. This is really a requiem for ret to CSU as a technique because um, I want people to know about it. It's amazing. And it kind of is dead now uh, for recently compiled binaries. But here's why it's amazing. So first of all, look at the bottom of this thing. See all these pops? RBX, RBP, R12, R13, R14, R15. And then if you jump in the middle of this pop R14, you actually get a pop RDI out of there. If you jump in the middle of the pop R15, you get a pop RSI. So just these, this little bit of the end of that function gives us control over like, what, eight registers so that we can do things with, with ROP. But that's not the only part of RET to CSU that's incredible. The real power is up here. So check this out. See this RDX? So move the contents of R14 into RDX. Move the contents of R13 into RSI. Move the contents of pretend that says R12 into pretend that says RDI. Okay? And then call, if you ignore the brackets, call R15. Um, there's one layer of indirection here, but it means that if you can control R15, R12, R13, and R14, then you can do a three argument function call just using this and nothing else. So the next question is, well, how do I control R13, R12, uh, R14, and R15? Well, right down here, there is a chain of pops that does exactly that. So this is what we want. So as far as where do we want to go, right? We have control of the return pointer. I'm going to call this gadget pops, and I'm going to put that address in there, and hopefully the way it's cutting it off is, um, is still doable. So 4040, 4016, yeah, it should be it. So All right, so when we hit that return instruction and we have control of the stack, we're going to send ourselves to that spot I just showed you right here, right where it says pop RDX or RBX. And then we're going to, it's going to, the guy's just going to execute all of these. So we need to populate our stack so that there's stuff to pop off, right? So the first one, the, the next one I give it, it's going to put that value into RBX. The next one after that, it's going to put into RBP, R12, R13, and on down it goes. So... So that's going to go in RBX, RBP, and then 12, 13, 14, 15. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and then the last one is going to be where it actually goes to return, right? Because at the bottom of those pops is a little return instruction. That's where it's going to send execution. So once we've populated R12 through R15, we're going to send it up to that call. See where it moves, where it moves R14 into RDX, R13 into RSI, R12 into RDI, and then it does the call? This is where we're going to go. So we're going to call that part of it gadget call. And then I'll show you in GDB first as soon as we get this going. 
We're definitely going to run out of time, by the way. <laughs> but it's okay. Like I said, I'll post all this uh, in the Discord, along with a solution uh, that you can choose to spoil or not spoil, if you so choose. We have 11 exactly. Uh, so, oop, that says gadget calls and an S. All right, let's see if that went. Okay, seg fault knows like zeros. That's uh, although I kind of wonder. Yeah. Let's put a break point. That's what an adult would do. So where do we want to break? I want to break right here at this pop art. Actually, that return that we're doing the overflow in would be a good one. So in process client, if I can get down there. Oh my god, you're just freaking out. OK. Oh, it's the search feature. It's just lagging, I see. So let's go down to the ret. So we're going to put a uh, breakpoint on the return instruction. And then we're going to kind of step and see if it does what we think it should do. All right, so before we continue, we're going to do break. And we're going to break on that return, the one that we, uh, that we control. OK, and sure enough, it hit the break point. So I'm going to, as always, check and make sure I am where I think I am. I'm going to kind of just peek at the stack and make sure it looks like what I think it's supposed to look like. OK, so we see an address to return to, and then we see a bunch of zeros. Remember, we put that big chain of zeros. So the way that you can execute a single instruction is with SI. It's like step instruction or step in. And it says we're in uh, libc, csu, init. So I'm going to look at the first eight instructions there. And there's our pops with the ret, right? And then if we look on the stack, we should see all those zeros that we populated. They're going to fill in all those spots. And then at the end, we have an address that's going to go with this red here. So if we, if we step once, what's going to happen is it's going to take this zero off the top of the stack. It's going to pop it into RBX. We, do it, we step again, it's going to take the next zero on the stack, and it's going to pop it into RBP. And that's how we control R12, R13, and R14, and R15. Um, so let's step uh, one, two, three, four, five. Check where we are. OK, we got one more pop. So now we're sitting on the ret at the end of libc, csu, and net. So I'm going to step and see where we go. OK, so we were one off. Um, because we ended up uh, trying to go to zero. <laughs> so let's fix that. Oh, look at this, the R15, R15 at the bottom. You guys didn't catch me. I feel so hurt. All right, so we're going to step, 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 get back where we were. OK, so now we control R12 through R15 plus RBX plus RBP. They're all just filled with zeros right now. But this matters because we're going to take whatever's in R14 and we're going to stick it in RDX. In R13, we're going to stick it in RDI. R12, stick it in RDI. And then R15, we're going to call that. Again, there's a little bit of weirdness here, but we'll, uh, we'll get around that. So. That mapping, I'm going to put as little comments, and then we're going to try and fill the values in and see if we can get a call to write and at least leak the address out before, the, uh, before our time together ends. So what were those moves one more time? It was in uh, CSU init. All right, so RDX is 14, RSI is 13, RDI is 12. So 14, 13, 12. So that's going to be RDX. That's going to be RSI. That's going to be RDI. OK, so what do we say? What do we, we're trying to build this call to write, right? Right, right? The first argument needs to go into RDI. So that needs to be a 4. 
The second argument goes into RSI. That needs to be the address in the global offset table of where right is. The reason that we're trying to leak this back to us is because it's a libc address. We don't even care what libc address it is. We just care that it is a libc address. So we're going to stick that in there. And then we're going to do eight because we're leaking eight bytes. So we need to go find the uh, got entry for write. Okay, and then we're gonna see if that gives us this address back. There was no pointer leak in this program. Not that all that like printf, percent, whatever stuff that people use for pointer leaks, it didn't exist. All we have is an overflow and we don't know where libc is, but we can still leak it out and still kind of keep going, right? So hopefully this will work, we shall see. So what we're gonna do is SI and try to get back to that spot. Uh, we are over on time, but we are very, very, very close to like this little bit, so I hope the next speaker, please forgive me. Um, okay, we got seg fault. Why did we get seg fault? Let's look. Okay, there's a zero in there. Is Machinist here? Hi, Machinist. Appreciate you. Oh, so R15 is zero, that makes perfect sense. So remember, the function we're actually calling is the write function, okay? So we're gonna put the got entry for write in here because that little call with the brackets actually derefs it. So we can use the got entry for write for both what we're gonna send back and how we're gonna send it. So let's try that out real quick. We're going to step, 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 step. See where we are. OK, we're about to stick these in there. Let's step, step, step. Uh, let's double check our arguments really quickly. So RDI's first argument is a four. RSI is a what looks like a valid address. And then RDX is an eight. What about R15? That is the got, that, that is the got entry for write. So let's see if it goes. Ooh, what's this? Sterling. Let's do backtrace and see what happened. From CSU init. Oh, it's going somewhere and then going. Yeah, so where this eventually leads is that you probably have to fix up the alignment of the stack, which is slightly more complicated topic to get into. But what this does is it sends, out, it sends back to you the address in libc of the right function. From there, you look at that libc file and you say, how far away from the top of that libcso is the right function? You do some subtraction, and now you can figure out where all of libc is and then you re-trigger the same overflow, but now you know where everything is. libc has like 30,000 gadgets in it, and every single function you would care about. So that's where you can do things like open flag.txt, and then read and send it back to yourself, and that's kind of where this thing goes from there. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately, but if you come find me, I am more than happy to walk you through um, the rest of this. Say again? Oh, it's okay, now let's, let's, let's just roll. We're good. All right. Uh, hopefully you learned something, even if we didn't get all the way through it. Um, there's like four more steps after this, like half an hour long each. So I definitely, uh, yeah, misestimated how long this would take. But uh, I hope you learned something anyway. And uh, hopefully Machines has a good talk for you.
Thanks.